All right, uh, Steve, so uh, you went across the country and you looked at uh, electoral financing. It's especially kind of interesting for us because we're right in the middle of an election now. Uh, just tell us what kind of went into the whole study. The first, uh, first stage was a compre comprehensive research of, of all the province's electoral finance legislation. And then we assembled an experienced audit team that used matrices, and we went through 15 categories of the legislation, and then we compiled the report. I imagine that you're not exactly real um, impressed with the whole, the way that it all came out. I, I was kind of suspecting it because we've done work on Alberta before, but I live in Calgary, I live in Alberta, so to me it's, it's really close to home and disappointing. And I, I feel it's an urgent matter. I am concerned that this hasn't become an issue in the election yet. And uh, we're putting a forum on, on April 17th, a public forum on democracy reform. So we're hoping that this will become a bigger issue in the election. What is the uh, BC, Saskatchewan, PEI, Alberta, get an app? What is the problem here in Alberta? It's multiple issues. For example, when we look at CAPS, we're just not saying, oh, they're high, they're too high. We actually look at the mean total income of Albertans, and then we factor that into gauging the fairness of them for everyone. So the 30,000 cap, based on the 30, 35,250 mean total income for Alberta, and that's based on Statistics Canada 2009, that means only 25% of Albertans approximately can afford that. It's cutting out three quarters of the population, and then we look at Alberta doesn't have expenditure limits on campaigns. That's a huge issue. And then the main one is they allow uh, corporations and trade unions to make contributions and to act as third parties. We don't feel that should be allowed. And we found in the research, which, which is really interesting, all the provinces that allow corporations and trade unions in tended to have extremely high uh, caps, they wouldn't have expenditure limits, and actually their laws and penalties against corporation trade unions were quite low. So this means that the trade unions and, and, the, and the corporations that you're talking about, they can get in and, and give more than, by not, you know, vis-a-vis, -vis, than get more in return from the government. There's suspicion of that, and there's some evidence of that, and uh, that, it, that obviously is a concern. When it comes to third-party advertising, and then they're going to have greater say in that because there's there's more money they can contribute as well, and that's going to impact electoral discourse. Democracy should be about the people. That's what we stand by. And but to allow the corporations and trade unions in, it's it's just it's just uh, displacing that. Um, it's creating unfairness. We should just make it about the people of Alberta. And fortunately. And I say this from a nonpartisan standpoint, there is one party out there of the nine registered parties, the Alberta NDP, which, which is promising to ban contributions from corporations and trade unions. I say that strictly from a nonpartisan objective standpoint. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's different, though, that the NDP would come out on that because, of course, a, a big part of the NDP's support is our trade unions. It is interesting because they get, uh, apparently, based on the latest financial data, they're getting about 25% of their donations from trade unions. Well, actually, in February, we did do a comprehensive audit on Alberta. We sent our recommendations to all the parties. Removing corporations and trade unions was part of that. So whether we influenced Alberta NDP, I, I don't know, but it is part of their policy now. It shows good on them because this is the standard being set by Manitoba, Nova Scotia, Quebec, they all don't allow it, and they scored very high in the audit. And we back it up with evidence that those systems are about the people and only about the people, and they're definitely a model to be followed. So the silver lining here, I, I want to say, is that Canada at the provincial level has some extremely high standard uh, electoral finance legislation in place already. So. It's just a matter of modeling after that. So to me, that's really positive. It's not like everyone scored low. So you would like to see uh, Alberta, PEI, Saskatchewan, Newfoundland, Labrador, Ontario, probably not New Brunswick since, they're, since they came in at a B, which is a pretty good passing grade. It's Nova Scotia, Manitoba, and Quebec and what they're doing. Well, actually, Quebec got a 100% score, and, you know, we're... We just look at that from a nonpartisan objective standpoint, but we couldn't find any flaws in their actual electoral finance legislation. 
you know, that's that doesn't look at corruption outside of that, because any system can be corrupted. But in terms of the legislation, to, to me, it's a model to be followed without question. This yeah, is straight up legislation. The rules can be broken by people who, who who take it upon themselves to do that. But the legislation that's in place is 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 really good in your mind. It's 100 percent. It's it's completely working in the interest of the people of Quebec. Any system, no matter how perfect it is, is always susceptible to human corruption, human misconduct. So you always have to have safeguards for that. But they're both important. You need the process in place. If you don't have the process like Alberta, then you're adding on any misconduct and it's you're in a real bad situation. But at least by having a great process in place, you're ahead of the game. As far as we're concerned, there's there's no reason why Alberta, BC, Saskatchewan, PEI cannot get to that standard. It, it's there. It's just it's just a matter of having the political will and doing it. Well, that's great, Stephen. Uh, is there anything yeah. else that we didn't touch on there? The FD uh, province report can be found at democracychange.org, and there's a lot of other information on our blog. On April 17th at 5.30 p.m. at the Talisman Center, uh, the Riverview Room, the FDA is putting on a public forum on this issue. Thank you very much for listening in to this episode of the Foundation for Democratic Advancements podcast. For the FDA to continue to improve democratic processes worldwide, we rely upon your generous donations. Donate to the FDA, please visit our website at www.democracychange.org. To learn more about our mission, vision, and work, you can also visit us on Facebook and on Twitter. Thank you very much for listening, and we look forward to seeing you again next time.